Hey, welcome. Thanks for coming to our session. Um, we're going to be doing a talk on the internet censorship and what governments are doing around the world. And we're going to stage it to be like a conversation. So the idea is us three or four with different perspectives are having a conversation. Um, I'll try to be the moderator um, and create some runway for, for the three panelists to have a conversation. Um, and it's something I think uh, the problem with these is you sit around the speaker room and you're getting ready and you're having such a great conversation you have to constantly be telling yourself like stop, save that for the stage. No, 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 stop. Stay. So we think we've got some fun things to talk about or at least we think it's fun. So to kick it off, uh, I'm going to start on my white right with Roger and everybody's going to introduce themselves and then we'll just jump right on in. All right? So thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine from Tor. Uh, I founded Tor long ago. I wrote the original Tor code, and now I wear all sorts of hats, and I've been paying more attention to the anti-censorship side of things, the anonymity research side of things, and the policy side of things, talking to governments and trying to uh, help them understand that end-to-end -end encryption is important and things like that, and that's how I find myself on a policy panel. Yeah. Hey, I'm Chris Painter. Uh, I've been doing cyber stuff for about 33 years now. I started as a federal prosecutor. I didn't start life as a federal prosecutor, but I was a federal prosecutor for a while doing cyber crime cases. Then I went to the mothership at Maine Justice in, uh, in DC. Then I was at the White House uh, creating the cyber directorate and then um, uh, was the world's first uh, cyber diplomat at the State Department. And now, among other things, I run a foundation uh, that's devoted to cybersecurity capacity building. And, you know, my, uh, Jeff and I share a love for a movie called Colossus, the Forbin Project, which you haven't seen. It's like one of the best movies out there. A little kitschy, but great. Yep, that's the, that's the original movie where the intelligent computer takes over the world to protect humanity from itself. And all the stories kind of come from that. It's based Nin on a three series of books, but yeah. Colossus, 19, the 1970, Forbin. 14 years before War Games were terminated. That's right. Um, I'm Joel Todorov. Uh, I'm a Fed. I've been a Fed for some time now, uh, working on technology issues really all around government. Right now, I'm working for the Office of the National Cyber Director in the White House, and some of the projects that I work on relate to this, relate to these questions of internet censorship and countering the misuse of authoritarian technologies. Um, there is one caveat I do have to provide. Uh, they are letting me speak, but they said I have to put in a plug for ONCD and the work we're doing and to tell you all to go to the website and look at uh, the documents we've published. And so uh, please consider you, you actually have me. some requests for a comment, right? It's we do. Not, it's yeah. not just look at the documents. Yeah, so there, is, there are areas where you can actively contribute. Uh, on. We'll talk more on this topic later, but uh, one on open source security. There's a request for information out. So if people are interested in that topic, you can look there. Uh, one on workforce and the cybersecurity workforce. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, please do give them a look. Um, there's, there's really a lot on there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's kick it off. Let's get this party started. You said something. I'm going to jump on you first. Um, you said uh, censorship and other authoritarian technologies. What, what are authoritarian technologies? Do we know? I mean, it's not, everything is dual use. So is it really just the way in which the commercial off-the-shelf technology is configured, like the way the router is filtering? Or is it we can actually make that distinction? Um, I feel like we're starting with a really hard question, uh, and I love it. So I'm, I don't have, I think, a great answer, but I have a thought, and the thought is, the general sense we come in with is that technology starts as being value neutral, that we imbue it with values by creating it, by operating it, by owning it. And so a technology or a protocol is not itself going to be authoritarian or democratic. And I think there's a sense in which that is certainly true, right? Uh, maybe that's DNS blocking or IP or something like that. You can certainly imagine a lot of entirely legitimate uses, and you can also see instances where an authoritarian regime would misuse the same technologies, the same protocols, to do something like uh, target ethnic minorities or surveil journalists or prevent people from accessing LGBT information on the internet, right? 
those would definitely be problematic. And we can say, okay, the values that we're ascribing to this are those from the owners and operators. Um, but, 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 but different than, say, I don't know, command and contr commercial command and control for ransomware or NSO, you know, things that have made it, that, it, it, there seems to be a threshold that gets you on a sanctions list or on a commerce, you know, WASNA arrangement list, right? So there are some. Yeah, so you can definitely do things that are really problematic with a technology. And so I know uh, Chris has some specific thoughts on this, but one of the things that I'll also flag that I think is interesting is this question of our default state of saying technology is val value neutral. One of the things the Biden administration is looking at, and you'll see a resurgence in, is this focus on things like standards bodies, which gets to this idea that the, the value neutrality of technology is a really good first pass. But then you have to start asking, is that the case always? Or are there things where really early in the design and implementation, you might build something in a way that it's predisposed to be used by an authoritarian regime, in a way that it's predisposed to enable an anti-democratic or an anti-liberal use of the technology? And how do we think about ensuring that our values are put into the tech stack are put into protocols, are put into standards from the beginning. Um, and that, I think, is, is certainly an area of ongoing interest and an area of ongoing effort. I mean, I, I think that's right. I think that the technology is largely value neutral. And we've always said that. It's been like a talking point for forever that, that people said. And I think it's largely true. Uh, you, there is some technology, some things that are clearly designed for purposes that are to subvert civil liberties or to enable uh, uh, un, unreviewed and undemocratic sort of uh, surveillance of folks. But the problem is, whenever we've talked in the past about, oh, we need to regulate this, oh, we need to make this illegal, that's really problematic because of the dual use uh, issue that, that Jeff talked about. And uh, to give you a good example, we tried this years ago now with the Vassenar. The Vassenar arrangement is this export control issue that's used for lots of different things. But we tried this with, uh, with software that could be used to either launch attacks or to uh, surveil and the, you know, to protect civil liberties. And uh, the U.S. was a big mover of this and we did it. Uh, but the problem was it really didn't work very well because it also inadvertently covered security software. So this is a tension which I think is very difficult, but I do agree with you. I think there's some ways you can architect the, the tools, the technology uh, that clearly are meant in a, in a bad way. Uh, but at the same time, it's a pretty slippery slope, so figuring out where that line is, I think, is very difficult. And I'll disagree so that we get a good panel here. <laughs> uh, so I keep hearing that technology is inherently neutral, it's what you do with it that matters, but you have to look at the architecture. Some technology is inherently decentralized that empowers a broad group of people. Some technology is inherently centralized that ends up centralizing power. So you might start off thinking uh, the technology side is inherently neutral, but no, technology is inherently political and you need to think through what people are gonna use it for. Because, so it, it, if you're going to end up, uh, if you're not thinking it through, then you're going to end up reinforcing the existing power well, structures. And if you want to build something that, that changes the power structures, that's political, and you need to think that through at the architecture. Wait, wait, I have, no, I have to challenge Excellent. it a little bit. And I would agree with you it's political, but I would, uh, I would also say it's inherently now commercial. And so the commercial pressures are centralized for efficiency. And the market forces now are essentially creating pools of technology then that it's like an attractive nuisance. If you only have to provide one subpoena to Gmail and you get half of the email accounts on the planet, boy, that's really convenient. But if you had to supply subpoenas to 50,000 email providers, that's a pain in the ass. And so maybe it's not also political, it's a side effect. Or, or the, the political side sees the market force and say, wow, this is great for us. Yeah, that centralization is super scary. And the centralization is a choice made by people when they're building their architecture to centralize the power or decentralize the power. And that centralization, it's not just one email provider, it's not enough CDNs, not enough undersea cables between continents, not enough app stores. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think decentralization is one area, but when you get beyond that, I think it's tough to draw that line again and say, okay, it's, it's, you're, you're right, but then how do you actually get to that next mile? And 
And look, it's this and that technology, it's policy too. I remember having a conversation when I was at the State Department with the Chinese uh, and the, China, the Cyber Administration of China. And I was, for some reason, we were talking about public private partnerships, which seems like a pretty good thing, right, normally? And they said, oh, you're absolutely right. We need public-private partnerships because we can't monitor the internet alone. We need, uh, we need their help. <laughs> Not what I had in mind, but... <laughs> yeah, just to pick up on that quickly, uh, riffing off some work that my colleagues at the State Department have done, if you look at censorship around the world right now, more than two-thirds of the world's population is, you know, is having their human rights on the internet infringed based on uh, these re repressive regimes surveilling them or censoring them on the internet. And they are spending billions of dollars to build out ecosystems that enable surveillance and censorship at scale in real time, right? There is, there is a clear push for, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I think I would use sen uh, like the idea of centralization versus decentralization a little differently. The idea of moving away from a free and global internet to essentially a series of isolated networks of censorship and surveillance that an individual repressive regime would want to run often against their own citizens. And they would want it uh, centralized in the sense that they want the authority, but not centralized in the sense that uh, there would be global interconnectivity where they would have to reach out to a different central location to engage in their sort of mass surveillance. And that, that's been going on for a while because, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, when she was the Secretary of State, gave a speech launching the Freedom Online Coalition, a group of a lot of countries that champion Freedom Online. And she talked about digital bubbles, authoritarian bubbles around the world. And that's just been accelerating, I think, since then. And that's, you know, uh, again, it's, it's hard to stop that from happening. And, and we've gone from the promise of the internet is the greatest thing in the world. It's the greatest democratizing force in the world, too. It's also the greatest way that repressive regimes, and not just repressive regimes, we'll get into this later, can do things that are not great, and includes the monitoring and controlling their citizenry in ways that they haven't been able to before. The, um, talk, just one other thought on the centralization. The thing that really bothers me is the, um, we have no plan B for uh, Roger's heard me say this, we have no plan B for uh, certificate authorities. So if, if something goes wrong with, with TLS or certificate authority structure, there's no like, we'll use DNSSEC and we'll push out Dane, TLSA records, and then the web will keep going, right? There's no agility. We're all in. And the browsers went away. All the browsers now have removed support for Dane in TLS certificates. The only thing that's using it now are uh, mail servers. So I guess if the certificate authority system sort of collapses or is under attack or is subpoenaed or, you know, uh, Let's Encrypt blows up and that's 90 something percent of all certificates, if Let's Encrypt goes down, we'll be able to change mail because mail servers use Dane, but nobody else will be able to browse the web. That really worries me that we have no backup plan and governments know this. And governments that want to suppress, no. I, I just saw a, uh, a takedown against an Onion domain name for, I think, a white supremacist website. The registrar in Greece pulled the TLS certificate name for, it, and that's just, that's going to be the start. I'm, I'm happy they did that, but I'm just saying that soon we'll be seeing subpoenas or we'll be seeing takedowns on TLS certificates. And since browsers are now default, that is the gateway. Right? And we don't have these conversations and we build these technologies that now we have no agility. So don't be surprised, you know, when the world you describe happens. Um, and so when I look at my Rolodex of well, who do I call, what's the backup plan, I get Roger. I don't get five Rogers, I get one Roger. There is one option, kind of, and it's Tor. And it's not perfect. But we don't have a thriving ecosystem of five Tors. You know, and that, that worries me. You know, and I want you to talk now about your unbounded adversaries. Yeah, so part of the, the reason why I am thinking about the policy side of things, and it, it's fun to have the balance here because we've got a policy person saying, yeah, 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 we're, we're, we've got the policy stuff under control, but if only you could build better tech for us, then we'll be able to keep people safe. 
and here I am, the technology side, saying, yeah, 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 we're, we're, we've got tools and they work pretty well and millions of people are using them, but if governments are unbounded, if they're breaking their own laws, if they're uh, attacking everything at will, if they're putting billions of dollars into harming people, uh, we can't solve this with technology alone. If they, like in China, uh, in the Uyghur province, if they end up sending a person to live in the house of each of the families there, I can't, Tor is not going to be what they need. This is a, like a social problem, a political problem, a policy problem. So yeah, the reason why I'm, I'm thinking broader than just the technology is uh, increasingly we're seeing governments that, uh, that do more than technical attacks, and we need to tackle that at every layer. This is, this is your um, censorship implies surveillance model. Yes, so uh, we used to think of this, so Tor started as a way to let you browse the web more safely, meaning metadata, communications metadata protection, so people watching you can't learn what you're doing. And then it, it morphed into a censorship resistance thing, and the key to realize is they're actually the same thing. So when, some, when a government is censoring your internet connection, they start off by surveilling you to learn who you are and what you're doing to decide whether to let you do it. So it's actually two sides of the same coin. Um, so if you're only thinking about censorship, you should be thinking about surveillance. If you're thinking about surveillance, the next step to think about is censorship. These are both uh, uh, two sides of the, the same issue. And that leads me to also think about end-to-end -end encryption and other attacks at the, the policy layer that are related to both censorship and surveillance. I, you know, I think the, the issue is you know, there's policy for liberal democracies and there's policies for repressive regimes. And, and it's much harder to change the policies of repressive regimes. And, and so, uh, you know, but, but there has been some good work. But, that's but, but if they're buying the technology designed for a liberal democracy... Well, that, that's what I was about to say. So I think there's been some good work that's been done. I mean, for instance, uh, the White House issued this anti-commercial spyware executive order, got 10 countries initially, I think it's up to maybe 15 or so now, maybe more than that, countries have signed on to this. Now they're all the, the good people, or the, what we think of as more of the good people. But there are things you can do to exert pressure on these more repressive countries, maybe not China, or Russia as easily, but a lot of the countries are sort of in the middle where you can have an impact and you have to use the full suite of policy tools you have and that's not just cyber stuff, that's trade and other things you can do. And I think there's been much more awareness and movement toward that recently. I think the other problem though is, you know, we think, we think of the world as binary, there's the bad guys and the good guys. Well, there's, there's all, even some of the good guys are starting to come down this path a little bit because they're worried about terrorism, they're worried about misinformation and disinformation. By the way, my, my suggestion to Jeff earlier was next year, the misinformation village should have the, uh, the sign out in front of a different room. So that it would, <laughs> I think it would be perfect. <laughs> um, they did that when, the, uh, when the, uh, the Soviets invaded Prague. They changed all the, the street signs, so it's good misinformation. Uh, so, you know, I, so I think that the problem is you have to target the repressive regimes, but you also have to think about uh, liberal democracies and where they're going and what path they're taking on these issues. And that involves the gnarly debate around encryption and all these other things. But where, you know, where can we make sure that we have the kind of transparency, rule of law, and they're actually following the laws, as, as was said too. And, that, and you know, that's, that's not just an issue for the cyber community, that's an issue for the entire you know, policy community and all the tools that we might have to might change behavior. Yeah, I, I largely agree with what everyone was saying. I think one of the things we're looking at in the Office of the National Cyber Director is that question of what's the backup plan, right? Because uh, to some of these points, Tor is an excellent tool in certain instances. But if a government sends some people with guns to the one cable landing site in a country and says, turn it off, uh, Tor doesn't help you. So the question is, what do you use when the censorship model is a man comes in the room with a weapon? right? Or a complete internet shutdown. And there will be things that we can do with technology. There will be things we can do with policy. And for us to have efficacious solutions, I think we have to work it together. That's part of why we're here. I hope that's part of why we're talking about it. That's part of why there's going to be a workshop later today to hear from you and to get and exchange ideas. But I also think we need to think of this almost from a network stack sort of layer to say, if someone is going after layer one to engage in censorship or surveillance, 
how do we ensure that there's security at that layer? If people are targeting you know, another layer of the stack, how do we ensure there's appropriate security at each of those layers? So um, I guess we didn't talk about this in, in the ready room, but um, maybe just talk about domain fronting, maybe first like why it's useful, but then why now it's people are not supporting it, right? Vendors are not, Google I think is stopping it, uh, you know, a lot of cloud providers don't domain front anymore, and that's what Signal Messenger really relied on for some protections. So we're not a repressive regime so much, but, but again, market forces are making it harder. I'm looking at you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so domain fronting is one of the tricks that we have at the technical level for getting around censorship. And the way that it works is you find a cloud provider like uh, Google or Azure or Fastly or Cloudflare, and you do a TLS connection. Uh, and on the outside of the TLS connection, in the SNI field, you list a domain that they're not going to block. And then once you've done the TLS connection, inside the encrypted channel, you do a host header for the domain that you'd actually like to go to. And technically, this is violating some sort of spec somewhere in IETF land, but it works in most places until a few years ago when Telegram was using it to get around blocking from Russia, and then Russia said, hey, uh, Amazon, could you quit that? And Amazon said, why, yes, Russia, we will turn that off. Thank you, Russia. And so Amazon stopped it. They convinced Google to stop it. They convinced Microsoft to stop it, but Microsoft said they were going to stop it, and then they didn't, which is pretty cool of them. Uh, but they're eventually going to. So some, some uh, CDNs allow it, but many of them don't these days. And it's one of, the, one of the better working tricks, though you have to pay cloud prices for the bandwidth you send across it. So some circumvention tools like Tor use domain fronting, not for all of the traffic, but just for the signaling in order to have a reliable channel to set things up, and then you fall back to some other channel. But yes, it's, uh, it's a trick that is closing down as the Western huge companies uh, change their mind about letting it work. Right, and so no fight in the UN necessary, right? That's how much we really uh, we care about these technologies and the rights that they can support, right? The ITF is not racing to formalize it into a thing to support the human rights aspect. It's just disappointing. Although, although participating in a lot of UN negotiations, Getting consensus, because they always want to get consensus, is near impossible because all those repressive regimes are there. Right. And just for people's awareness. What do I mean? It's not even brought up. We're not even saying, is there a letter from the White House saying, hey, uh, Google, don't worry about it. We got your back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Or some, I don't know, 50 states' attorneys general saying, don't worry about it. We'll tell Russia, you know, to go stuff themselves. No. There's not like a state or a local tribal territory. I mean, there's, there's nothing. And I don't know if it's because these are kind of technical things and it just doesn't reach awareness of, of policymakers, or is it actually like they thought it through and said, no, that's not worth a fight? I mean, I suspect it's part of that. I, I suspect that the policymakers just don't understand the technology and what it's doing. I suspect part of it, too, is when you go to the companies, look, they're, they, they're there for profits, right? So it's but, much easier. But paying but for no, it. No, no, but it's much easier now with Russia for them to say no than it is for China. And so we have to kind of come over that. We have to figure out how to disincentivize that, that conduct or incentivize the good conduct. Um, and, and, you know, part of it's government, what governments can do, including our government. But if it's just our government, that's not going to do it either. And, and, you know, just to, again, for people's awareness, there's a lot of discussions in the UN now on all these different issues. One is they're now negotiating a cybercrime treaty, um, which is pretty far in the negotiations. And these issues, the procedural issues with cybercrime and how you get evidence, some of these issues are being covered, not in this technical detail, which is part of the problem, I think. But, you know, this may be a way to push the more repressive regimes to have more things that allow them to do stuff. Uh, or not. And so I think the, the West is very concerned about enabling repressive regimes to get more access, but at the same time trying to get law enforcement access. And that's a difficult issue. So, you know, this community, I think, should follow those kinds of things and make sure that you're at least aware of what's going on, just like you should comment on the documents that you talked about. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'll add is, so in March, there was a big event in D.C., a, a summit for democracy, yeah. where you know, countries around the world came together. There was uh, one before. Um, 
This year, one of the focuses included countering the authoritarian misuse of technology, and there was a call to action to the private sector that went out. Now, that did not talk about any one specific protocol. It talked about things that is sort of slightly higher layer of abstraction for a lot of reasons. Um, but certainly, there's an administration interest in exactly this, and you are seeing press coming from the White House saying, we need to figure out ways to counter this. There was specific discussion of things like VPN and ensuring VPN availability and that you could connect securely and safely uh, to things like VPNs, uh, along with some other things sort of explicitly identified, and then otherwise an invitation to engage uh, primarily with our colleagues at the State Department on how you could do this and uh, how you could work collaboratively with the government to ensure that people did have freedom to access securely and safely like the real internet. Do you, do you think um, do you think the government then could use sort of the power of the purse to sort of set priorities? So like um, your cloud provider, I don't know, is in alignment with Russia proposal one two three for censorship. So we're not buying from you until you are not in alignment with authoritarian censorship model one, two, three. And if the cloud provider wants to have a seal on their homepage that says, look, we comply with the we're not censorship friendly, then you know what I mean? Like you, it doesn't have to always be a policy. It can be a choice. It can be a, a labeling regime. It can be a way of the government saying, hey, we only buy from, you know, green energy providers. I don't feel like I have like a fully established answer, but I'll say a microcosm of this that I think is pertinent does circle back to that executive order about commercial spyware uh, and certain commercial spyware entities that were taking actions that were viewed as uh, problematic, really divergent from our interest, uh, enabling things like the surveillance of journalists or dissidents. And the administration pushed out this executive order saying, hey, we're no longer going to be using these technologies that, that pose a national security risk, that pose these sort of broader risks to us. And I think that is perhaps an example of this power of the purse of saying we're no longer playing uh, with these entities. And it was followed up with sort of more discreetly um, with some entity listings. So that are, those are the Department of Commerce labels certain entities making it very hard for them to do business. That ends up being sort of export restrictions and really just sort of gums up a business. Yeah, the, the, the combined entities list, or what do they call it now? The, uh, it used to be you had to watch two or three different lists to see if you were having a personal felony. <laughs> um, now it's, there's a combined list, I think. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I do, but your, your idea is an interesting one. There's two questions about this sort of labeling thing. The federal government's just recently, and we've been talking about this for 30 years, or maybe 20 years, uh, moved this idea, maybe a good housekeeping seal of approval for cybersecurity stuff. That's been, you know, Singapore's done that. It's happened in other parts of the world. The EU has an act. Uh, and the U.S. is moving forward. There's been legislation and other things. So that's, that may be a way to deal with it. But I wonder how much that's going to actually affect the market. Are people going to, outside of a smaller group of people, are they going to value software more because they say we're human rights compliant? Hopefully they would. I would hope they would. Yeah, but, but it's more know. about signaling the, the values of the government. And look, no authoritarian cloud provider has that seal. What a, what a shocker. Right? You've got to draw some bright lines between the difference between team rule of law and team authoritarian because if you don't they're just going to be bled together they're all sitting in the same room in the IETF right they're all sitting in the same room at wherever they're all whistling when they have standards <laughs> yeah so we need a way to say look how we are different i think labeling is an important step here but it more and more we're seeing a shift in how the arms race goes so it used to be uh, western companies sell deep packet inspection tools to uh, repressive regimes and they use them to harm their citizens. And uh, so it would be a technology like they look for this header, we change it to this and go back and forth. But here are two examples that we've seen recently where we're, we're shifting how the arms race goes. One of them is in Turkmenistan over the past few months. So the Ministry of Censorship in Turkmenistan is basically uh, block listing the whole internet. They block Fastly, they block Cloudflare, they block Akamai, they block most hosting providers. And uh, so we've been running some Tor bridges on residential IP addresses and it kind of works, sort of. But it turns out that they're taking bribes to unblock certain people in Turkmenistan. 
So if you're a company or whatever, you pay them $1,000 US and now you get real internet. So this is not something I can solve at a technical level. Another challenge that we're seeing in China recently, it is not, so China has a policy to censor the internet, sure, but they also have accidental like economic byproducts of how they're growing because so you're, there you are in China, you want to use a website in China, uh, everybody wants to do that, so they buy more bandwidth, they make the pipes bigger, they make the bandwidth inside China really good, but nobody's adding pipes from China to the rest of the world. And that means that if you're in China trying to get to Google, even if they didn't explicitly block it, you've got 15% packet loss because too many people are trying to use too small pipes. And for economic reasons, they're not bothering to add that bandwidth. So that's a, that's a case where it doesn't matter what code I write, there's not enough bandwidth for people to, to do what they're trying to do, uh, and that goes back to the economic challenge. There's a, um, um, there was a sort of a comment maybe, or maybe we can look at it just briefly from the other lens. Who are the people that are being censored? Because when we say that, we don't necessarily mean uh, bad guys. What are these people just exploring the internet and the regimes are afraid they're going to learn about equal rights or something? Like, what is the danger in these conversations you're having that justify this level of intervention and billions of dollars spent? What, what is the fear? I mean, there, there are lots of vulnerable groups, and, they, and depending on the country, they could be religious groups, or often political groups that are being targeted. Um, back to what you said about the State Department, part of the State Department, the Democracy and Human Rights Bureau, has for a long time funded a lot of projects, including yours, among others, uh, to try to get around censorship. And it is kind of country specific, but uh, it's not just, you know, a lot of the countries don't have the capability or the bandwidth to censor everything or to look at everything. China may be a little different. But uh, so they target a lot of these groups who they view as threats to their own political stability often, and that those are the groups that are most at risk. But not only those, I mean, it could be LGBT, it could be, there's a whole wide range of groups depending on the country, depending on the authoritarian regime you're in. Uh, that that are targeted and and you know I don't people but, but are, they don't justify it that way they justify no, they, it they, using they, they, they justify it on the basis of security it's the security of the state so that that's the overarching justification one of the things they thought was a big advance at the State Department when I was there and it's continued in the new bureau they created is to integrate human rights with security and a lot of times. When we go to other countries and talk about cybersecurity, they say, oh, that's great. That's a way for us now to control our citizens. No, no, no. You have to think about the human rights aspect, and you have to look at them together rather than silos. So uh, yeah, I, you know, I, th I think it's, and again, it goes back to the point of like, well, how do you change that? You can change it by using the tools you have, economic and other tools, to try to change that country's view, because basically, the regime that's in power kind of likes to stay in power. and so. It's hard to tell them, don't do that, uh, because they're going to they're gonna do it anyway. And so how can you exert pressure? And some of it's commercial pressure. Some of it's not just governments, but companies, too, as we've seen with Russia. Yeah, so in our experience, it isn't that the censorship ministry sits down and makes categories and goes to find websites that, block, that, that match the categories. It's more about the, the job of the censorship ministry is to never get noticed by the authoritarian leaders in charge. So every time something goes wrong, they're embarrassing the, the head dude and they need to react and start blocking the things that are embarrassing at that time. So it grows organically where uh, maybe some particular activity is in the news and then they have to shut that down. Um, and this, this same pattern happens not only in China where they have to guess what they should try to block next, uh, but it also ends up happening in uh, Denmark and Australia and Sweden and so on where they don't have a censorship ministry but whatever they call their online security group uh, ends up uh, deciding that they need to block Pirate Bay or wherever it starts and then, uh, and then it bleeds into blocking more things based on uh, reacting to whatever is politically embarrassing at the time. But, but it's also the, the multiplying effect of not just the state doing it but creating policies that are so vague that the companies, the ISPs and the others, and this is what China does, doesn't know where the line is, so they over-enforce. They go further than they need to do, and, and it's even worse. And, and the state's fine with that, because they're like, over-enforcement's better than, uh, under than under-enforcement. Yeah. Um, so then, how do we, uh, going forward then, I guess in your sort of utopian vision, give us, give me a, where are we at in five years? Where are we at in 10 years? I mean, if, 
the team rule of law undecided and authoritarian, if this continues to sort of metastasize, do we have sort of, what, three buckets of the internet, right? Your model of where, where does this leave us? Because what I don't see is any forces that are, oh, everybody's going to have to use the exact same technology with no censorship built in. That's not a thing. So that means censorship will continue to evolve. And so it's important that we have policies to either make technology instead of being neutral, let's make the technology, um, at least if we're going to, the federal government's going to buy it, it has a bias toward good, whatever good values are. It's transparent or accountable or, um, so maybe one side we have to shift the bias toward good because we know the bad is going to continue. Is, so when you look in your crystal ball, tell me what you see. Want to start? Do you want to start? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm, I've, I don't have as much optimism as Jeff hopes I do. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you a bit more pessimism. Uh, so the, the Iran thing that I've been watching, so Iran's goal is to build a halal internet. They want to isolate themselves, they want to cut off all, all the outside internet connections, and to do that, they need their own Facebook, they need their own Google, Gmail, their own everything, and they're not big enough as a country, as an ecosystem, as a like, software ecosystem to have that. Uh, but it gets worse than that because, so for a while they would block Gmail and everybody in Iran would say, screw you, you block Gmail, I don't like you, stop blocking. Uh, and then uh, a, a previous uh, administration in the US uh, called up Google and said, hey, can you like sanction Iran? Can you like turn off all the Gmail accounts for people who speak Farsi? Anybody coming from Iran, just shut them off. Uh, and that means that uh, when people in Iran tried to get to their Gmail, Google was the one that blocked them. And that was a sanction, but the result was it's easier for Iran to end up with their isolated halal internet because uh, there's nobody complaining anymore. You blame Google for trying to turn off your, your Gmail account. You don't blame your own government anymore. And we're seeing the same thing in Russia where various telecommunication providers in the West are like, we're going to sanction Russia. We're turning off their telephone connections. We're turning off their ISP, their internet connections. That'll show them. They'll have to stop the war now. Uh, and the result is that they're letting Russia isolate itself in the same way. So are we going to end up with one amazing internet that everybody's on? Uh, or are we going to end up with each of these countries, uh, China's doing great at not building the rest of the, the bandwidth for people to get to the rest of the internet. Russia is going to try to isolate itself. Iran uh, is excited to do so. They haven't succeeded yet. So that's where we're going unless we figure out something at the, at the not only technical level to fix it. So I, I, you know, I'm a recovering lawyer, so I'm usually a glass half full sort of person. Uh, but. I think there are some good signs and bad signs. I mean, the bad, you know, I agree with everything you said. If you also look at the Freedom House report of the, the reports every year on the state of freedom on, uh, on the internet, and it's gotten progressively worse and continues to get worse. So that's not a great sign. Um, and I do think the, the, there's more and more countries who are turning to this more, you know, there's also a lot of political churn where more right-wing administration, uh, um, uh, parties are winning larger and they're, they're more uh, disposed, predisposed toward this kind of uh, activity and so that's not good either. Um, and I do think you're seeing this kind of balkanization, which I wasn't allowed to use that word in state because uh, I could I'd say fl splinter net at the time. Um, you're, you're seeing this happen, I think that's going to accelerate too. The, the good things though, uh, the positive things, I think there's more awareness of this trend now. I think there's more uh, more desire and ability and actual political will to use tools that we wouldn't use before to try to counteract this, you know, and, and that's true both with cyber threats but also with these threats as well. Uh, I'm really heartened by the, uh, the executive order on commercial spyware. I'm heartened by the fact that a lot of countries signed on to that. I've heart I'm heartened by the fact that a lot of those countries said we're going to work together to promote this. When I go to these negotiations with the UN on the cybercrime treaty, I'm heartened that there are lots of uh, countries who are banding together and saying human rights has to be a core part of this treaty. Uh, now, there's other countries that say no, enough with the human rights already, but that it's good that you have these countries do that because if it's a process where these countries are strong enough and pushing back, you're not going to get you know, the kind of repressive language in, a, in an instrument that's global. Uh, but I acknowledge the challenges. And look, I, I wish it was going to get better. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's got a long way to go before we get there. But I do think there's more policy awareness than there ever has been. And, and so that will help. It's definitely going to be hard. There's no doubting that it's going to be hard. But 
I think it's important that we start with the vision for where we want to go and that we aggressively try to move towards that. And I think you're seeing some of that. The executive order, uh, the national cybersecurity strategy, if you just look at the introduction uh, from President Biden, it talks about this idea of an affirmative vision where everyone has access to this open, free, secure internet. You're seeing from the Summit for Democracy to all of these interactions in the United States and with a, a cluster of allies around the world, a push towards saying, hold on, we are realizing this is a big problem, we're seeing the trend line is in the wrong direction, and we need to do something as a government, we need to do something in partnership with the people making the technology to stop it and reverse it. So, so um, okay, I, I want to go back to something. Although I will agree something with something you said. The, the, one of the problems is if you try to restrict those countries, you're absolutely right. They develop their own capability. They become more isolated. And that's true with the technology generally. Like we've seen this with uh, you know, uh, chips and other things where China is now like, developing this stuff because they can't get it. So you have to figure out where that balance is and how you can influence it. Yeah, so you mentioned something about, um, oh, no, I'm totally forgetting it. What in the world? Oh, um, so the companies are, are essentially saying, oh, we'll just disconnect Russia. We want to make life more miserable for them. And partially that's because there's no kind of coordinated message from the government saying, okay, IT providers, please help us block. They're doing it a lot of times because they think it's the right thing. And so it seems like maybe there's a role for government to say, no, we need very specific targeting against sanctioned individuals, not all of Rust Telecom, we just need to do it in these sort of net blocks or, you know, not the education ministry or whatever, but the arms ministry or the, and so does it just mean you're gonna have to get more precise? Because the alternative is a giant blunt block, or yes, yeah, so, uh, I know this isn't a perfectly satisfactory answer, but uh, I think this is hitting on this really important topic of how the government messages when we might want something blocked or when we might want something enabled, even that if that's counterintuitive to a business. And so later this afternoon, uh, you all here at DefCon, the policy space, there's a workshop. State Department is going to be there, along with ONCD, along with Roger and some others, and we're going to be able to talk about that uh, when there aren't cameras uh, in, in some more detail. And so I would encourage those of you who are interested in this very particular topic to come down and we'll have more conversations about that. Um, but it is certainly an area that the government is actively thinking about and is actively tr sort of trying to work through some of the nuances on, but uh, where at this point there's not comfort uh, talking to a camera. And that workshop is this afternoon at 2 o'clock in the policy at DEF CON area. Okay, we're rolling into the final four minutes, four or five minutes, so I'm going to just start on my right with Roger. Uh, for any final thoughts, anything you want to leave the audience with? Yeah, so we gave you a bunch of pessimism today, but there's also optimism because here we are all working on the project from the technical and the policy side, uh, and here all of you are learning about this. Please spread this uh, all with your friends. I'm going to, after this session, uh, answer whatever tour questions you may have over at the tour booth in the vendor area. And as a last thought, uh, EFF launched a campaign a few days ago to try to get more tour relays at universities in particular. So it doesn't have to be an exit relay, it could be a non-exit relay. So if you're connected to a university, please consider running a relay for EFF's campaign. Uh, and uh, my, my positive thought is that, uh, you know, like I said, there's more awareness of this. And I really think that this debate needs all of you. I mean, it, it needs people to be weighing in to raise these issues because a lot of times policymakers think, oh, that's too technical. I, you know, I don't know what the implication is. So explaining what the real implications of this are and what this is going to mean is important because it flags as an issue and that's the beginning of any kind of real policy debate. But, but about you can this. only be in that conversation if you're in the room. So it's really incumbent on the people having that conversation to spit out these RFIs, well, it, right? Give us yes. feedback. And I was going to say that. And that doesn't necessarily mean you being in the room, but it means that the people who are having these conversations, and increasingly they are, you know, we talk about this multi-stakeholder model, which means, you know, not just government people, but they should be talking to, to other stakeholders, including this community. Uh, and they're trying to develop mechanisms. Uh, some countries are better at that than others. The U.S. is trying to do a lot more of that, and I think trying to take advantage of those. And frankly, a lot of the U.S. people are here at DEF CON for the, exactly this purpose. So, so making sure that there's that connection and that you're at least aware of it. And then you can, you can raise the, the alarm bells in your own circles, too, and I think that helps. Um, 
I think for me, the, one of the big points that I'd like to get across is the idea that security and human rights are actually uh, two sides of the same coin, that they are not opposite sides of a scale. And if you are architecting a system, you're building something out, thinking about the security is not just going to be good for your users here, but can potentially enable people around the world to circumvent a censorship regime, that if you build and architect your system with, in the back of your mind, the idea that an authoritarian may be looking at this, may be trying to use it for a malicious purpose, but you might be able to build it or architect it in a way that enables someone to reach out and report government corruption, that enables someone to reach out and talk about human rights abuses going on in their country, that is good, I think, for business and also good for, for all of us, for the world, for human rights. And that is something that we can do as we ensure that our products are secure sort of from the get-go, that encryption is strong, that you know, the protocols don't have a button to say, you know, mass surveillance, click here, and you just click here, right? Like, th those are things that we need to think about from a technological perspective. Um, and I know you all are, are in that space. We're, we're in a policy space. You all are, are actually building. Uh, and building with that idea of human rights in mind, I think, is really important. All right, thank you so much for being at our panel on uh, internet censorship, and I uh, hope to see you around DEF CON. Thank you.